William Eric, especialista em recursos hídricos e ex-consultor de planejamento hídrico no Instituto de Recursos Hídricos da Agência Federal US Corps of Engineers. So, uh, Rick and I have been friends for many years, many, many years, and he's getting older and he forgets some things. But it is true that I said models always take too long to build, they're too expensive, and they don't answer questions that people really want answered. And the amazing thing is, is that that's still true today, except for these kind of models that we will talk about. It's very hard to take the skills that computer programmers have and use them in a social fashion. But that's the kind of model that we'll be talking about today. Okay. Okay. So, um, let me tell you a little bit about uh, the model that we built last year when we came down uh, to talk at a workshop in May. So, um, it is important that these models be simple and accessible to people so that this model was built in Excel. Uh, we'd be happy to provide a copy of it to anyone who wants it. If you have Excel on your computer, that's all you need to run this model. Uh, unfortunately, this is not a truly collaboratively built model because I had to build it with the information that could be um, developed down here at Unicamp through Stephanie's assistant while I sat in Virginia. So there was no official source of information that I would usually have access to to build such a model. And I did not have an alliance with the providers of water to help make sure that that model was correct. That said, we tested it against actual historic water levels, and it appears to work reasonably well. Last year, when we used that model in a workshop here in May, we showed that there was a serious risk that in the next several months in the coming year, that there would be a problem in the Cantarera system, and we did that by taking the current water levels in May of 2014, and then projecting ahead using 41 different hydrologic traces that represented uh, an 82-year period of historic flows. And we found that in, if the future of 2014 and 2015 were like several years in the past, that there would be a water shortage. And that turned out to be true. Um, we will talk about a shared vision planning process. Understand that um, we have done this for 25 years. It is a social process that must be agreed to by all of the principal players that are involved in a water decision. So last year when we came down, we asked five standard questions which we use to determine whether it will be possible to do this kind of a negotiation. Unfortunately, uh, some of the answers that we got from the people who participated were that it was not possible at the time to do shared vision planning in the Cantarera. Um, but here we are again, and we think uh, that there is a window of opportunity. Uh, we think that it will last for a month or two before the hydrological cycle makes people forget. Uh, and we think that there is a very simple project that uh, we could all do with Sabespi that might work. And I'll talk to you about that. Um, there are no perfect solutions. Um, I hope that we have avoided a terrible catastrophe here because of the recent rain. But we know that we will face this situation again and there will be hardship. But we feel that if stakeholders can work with decision makers and experts, 
then they can shape the risk that they will feel in the future, and that's very important. So there's a basic trade-off when you're talking about how can we recover from the drought uh, that occurred uh, in the last several months. We would like to increase deliveries so that people had normal water availability. And it may be that those deliveries can be increased now. But the more we increase deliveries, the greater the risk that we will face a crisis again in six or 12 or 18 months. So when we play this virtual drought game, we try different strategies and we accept a trade-off between the impacts of not having water now and the risks of a system failure later. When I was, when I first met Rick 25 years ago, we were quite confident that we could calculate this risk using hydrologic statistics. Since then, we have become more humble. We know that the past is not a perfect predictor of the future, so it's much more difficult to determine what a satisfactory level of risk is. But in the 25 years since, Rick and I have worked on methods that can be used in group process for developing what we call robust solutions. So these are solutions that uh, we feel will work about as well as any other solution even though the future is uncertain. Now I'm going to show you here, this is a portion of the Excel model that we built and I'm going to show you how we might design a sample strategy for recovering uh, from this drought in March of 2015 um, using this model. So, first of all, um, how will we test the policy? In this example, um, I said let's test it with the historic water inflows. These are inflows that we know have happened. They are of some use, although we know that the future may bring much drier conditions. It's one way to test the plan. We know that the system has dead storage and the model allows you either to use the dead storage, to use part of it, or to use none of it at all. So I've elected here to use the dead storage. We talked about triggers. So one of the things that you can do is to say, um, it's been raining, I'd like to deliver more water, but we will make an agreement that if the reservoirs get down to a certain level, we will again curtail releases. Um, you can ask yourself whether it would be possible in the short term to address other structural things such as water losses. Finally, you pick the amount of water that you'd like to see delivered. Yesterday, we saw a graph of water deliveries that had dropped from about 32 cubic meters per second down to almost 14 cubic meters per second over the last several months. So here I'm going to select a recovery amount of 25 cubic meters per second, let's say. And then another contingency plan. Let's say that we deliver a reduced amount of water, but uh, it turns out that we're lucky and the future is wet. It, it may well be that the next two years will be among the wettest that the Cantarera system has ever seen. Well, there's no sense in reducing deliveries if the reservoirs start to fill up. So another part of the plan that you can develop is to say we'll go back to 31 cubic meters per second deliveries if the reservoirs hit this certain level. What level should that be? This is something that you can experiment with in your game where it's safe until you find a level that stakeholders experts and decision makers all agree is acceptable. So, we ask how much water do we have now? I went out to the uh, Cantarero website this morning. I saw that there's a new display. It's, there's, you can see it's a different fashion 
The old display is on the left, the new display is on the right. Um, of course, we know that even this reporting of the percentage is controversial. So uh, this is the first fight that you could have in building the model, is what is the percentage of storage. So uh, according to the way that I would say it, um, the Cantarera system is at about 11.8% storage today. Professor Zufo would disagree because um, that means that the storage is not filled up the dead storage space. So that based on the reporting that has always been done, it's actually a negative 14%. 14.8? Yes. So, um, but when you develop a model together, you debate these things and you agree on what method you will use and then this is a fact that is shared by everyone. So uh, we've learned from so many people in developing shared vision planning. We learn from the field of dispute resolution that in negotiations over conflicts, it's important to have what they call a single text negotiating document. You fight with your neighbor about where your property ends and his property begins. So you hire a surveyor, you lay out markers, and now you have an agreed document that says this is where the property ends. Now we can fight about the fence. So our models go through issue by issue to create a single text negotiating document so that, as uh, Stephanie and Rick have said, that knowledge is power that all stakeholders now have. So uh, what, how shall we determine whether a recovery strategy is better than another recovery strategy? Of course, if you were to actually do this, it would be your responsibility to come up with scoring systems. And we've developed quite complicated systems, and we found that we often change them as the negotiation goes on, and people's understanding of the system response becomes more sophisticated. But for this morning, I use a very simple system, just two metrics, which I then combine. First of all, I take this strategy and I simulate 41 different possible two-year futures. And if in any one of those futures, which includes some very wet inflows and some very dry inflows, if in any of those uh, future simulations the reservoirs go dry, I count that as a failure and I think that's very serious. So I, I, I give that a very high weight. But uh, one way to avoid the reservoirs going dry is to not give anybody any water, and that's bad too. So the other thing that I score is how many months and how much deficit do I create with my delivery strategy? So for instance, if I say to recover from this drought, I'm Sebespi, I'm going to deliver 20 cubic meters per second, that means that in April, uh, people will get 11 cubic meters per second less than they did before. And although I don't know what those impacts are, I read in the blogs and the papers, I know that this is hurting people. If I continue to deliver that in May, that's another month where people are shorted by 11 cubic meters per second. June again. So this is also a bad thing. So this is the second thing that I count is how much shortfall uh, this strategy delivers to the people who must use the water. Then, the most arbitrary thing of all, I combine these two very dissimilar measures. And the simple way that I do it is I take an average shortfall from the 41 different simulations, and I take the failure percentage, multiply it by 1,000 to show how important that is to me, and I add the numbers together. So when we play this, uh, video game, the object is to get the lowest possible score. So here's my first example. Huh? No, no, I can, I can do it. Uh, first example. 
I'm going to test with historic supplies. I'm going to use all the dead volume. Why not? And um, I'm not going to have a drought contingency plan. Let's just see how that works. Um, of course, I don't think there's enough time to fix any leaks, so I'm going to say we don't have any leaks. We have a high unaccounted for water. And I'll say, um, this is the announcement in the paper tomorrow morning. We're delivering 27 cubic meters of water per second. I'm an optimist. Uh, uh, but I also don't allow for any possibility of increasing that, even if the reservoirs go full. So I run that, and I get a score of 341. And part of that is because uh, if I deliver that much water in at least one scenario, I run the reservoirs completely dry. So I've been too generous. So I'm going to try again, see if I can do better. Okay. The letters in red show uh, the difference in my strategy. This time, I'm going to be more careful. I'm going to say, um, this 27 cubic meters per second, that worked in 40 of the 41 simulations. So it's not crazy. It's not a crazy idea. But I've got a contingency plan now. And if the reservoirs do get down to 15% in any of those scenarios, then I will curtail water. Also, um, 27 is good, but 31 is better. So I also put a new condition on that if the reservoirs get to be 50% full, the level in California, then it's party time. Everybody gets 31 cubic meters per second of water. So now I've taken contingency plans to change the deliveries if it's very dry or it's very wet. I get a much better score now, 83. So let's, some, let's keep trying. Uh, I could be very severe and keep deliveries at 17 cubic meters per second. The reservoirs never go dry, but people suffer for two years. That's a bad one. Uh, I could increase it to uh, up to 26 cubic meters per second um, with the historic supplies. Um, and I get a, a very low score. Um, but increasing it from 26 to 27, that's the breaking point. So then you have uh, system failure. Um, drought contingency plans can help reduce it. Um, and in fact, if with the right drought contingency plan, using the historic inflows, you could go to full water deliveries today. And that gets a great score, 44. Fantastic. So I'm done. I'm a hero. I've solved the problem in Cantarera, except for this, that we don't know that the future will be like the past. So I haven't done due diligence. I need to test this wonderful plan with much drier conditions. Because let's remember, if I had run my test uh, with the water supplies up to 2012, I would have missed the conditions that ex actually existed in the last two years. So we have to be humble, and we have to say, this is a spendthrift plan. This is too much water. We have to worry about much drier conditions. So now um, I create a climate change inflow scenario uh, and there are many different ways to do this. We can talk at length. I just finished a five-year, $20 million study for the Great Lakes of the United States. There was a great deal of uh, argument about what c climate change would do. We had uh, climate change believers who believed that climate change was already changing the way the Great Lakes worked. We had climate change skeptics who believe that climate change isn't real, and we had to develop a strategy that would be voted and approved by all these different people, and we developed processes for doing that. So this can be done. You can make practical decisions despite this uncertainty. So this is the concept of robustness, something that we need to be concerned about. Um, when I was a young man, uh, there were sophisticated techniques in stochastic hydrology. Um, we had the vanity to 
estimate the error in our predictions. We know now that uh, we had no right to do that. Um, so we've developed new methods for testing the probabilities of failure. Uh, we do this not just as mathematicians, but we do it in a public process called informed consent. So let's imagine that we did do a virtual drought in the Canterbury system. We would have a panel, uh, and on the very first day, we would test some strategies and have the panel practice a decision. And of course, they would be very angry with me. It would be the beginning of the study. It would be too soon to know. But we would try to make them make a decision, and then we would say, how did you make that decision? And they would talk about what criteria they used. And they, we would say, why were you uncomfortable? And they would say, well, I really want this information or that information before I make an official commitment. And we would say, that's good to know. Now we know we have to get that information. Two months later, we would say, time for another practice decision. We would do it again. And they would say, but we haven't got our studies finished. And I said, I know, make a decision again. Now they would say, no, we understand our criteria. I've changed my criteria because I've been thinking about it for two months. So in the last two large studies that we did, we had 10 practice decisions over a four-year period. Little by little, the decision makers who sit in front of the public in a room like this make decisions and they explain why they made them, and they explain why they're concerned, what is uncertain in their decision making. And the public gets a chance to argue with them and shape those decision criteria. So after 10 of these practice decisions, the decision is very well understood by the public. It's very transparent. And the issues such as the uncertainty surrounding climate change thoroughly vetted and discussed and understood by the public. This is our proposal. Uh, we think that this region needs a recovery plan. Uh, you know, uh, it has been raining quite a bit. We had some tremendous storms while we've been down here. Who knows what will happen in the future, um, but the reservoirs are in better shape and we need to start thinking about Perhaps it's time to recover now from a drought. This is a happier time than managing an emergency crisis. So this is a rare opportunity where Sebespi might be interested in collaboration because it's not as difficult and as controversial. Um, this is a relatively simple task. The people uh, in the Cantarera system have m many more difficult things to do as we heard this morning there are treatment uh, water quality treatment problems long-term infrastructure questions uh, a very high leak rate that needs to be addressed these are much more difficult problems a drought drought recovery plan relatively simple and this is what we've learned uh, if you've read Margaret Keck's book uh, her experience mirrors ours, is that you cannot make collaboration happen by passing laws. You have to practice. You have to do it. You, if you put on a play, you have to have a dress rehearsal. If you collaborate on water, you have to have a meeting. You come together and you try. Uh, this is the only way to make it happen. This would be a simple little thing that the people could do in the Cantarera system. Uh, I am aware that there's a negotiation going on for a new 10-year contract on the Cantarera. This also is a window of opportunity that will not come again for a long time. And my uh, hope is that if this were done, it could be used as a pilot study for broader collaboration on more complicated issues. So. Easily said, much harder to do. What would you have to do if you wanted to play this game? Um, you would have to have an agreement with all the necessary players to play this game. And this was why we went home last year, was uh, the people in our workshop said that not all of the participants who would need to play in a shared vision planning process believed that it was in their best interest to do this. And we are realists. 
when we find these conditions, we say, call me later and we'll come back. So you would need that agreement. You could not use my model, which I built in my house while my cat crawled around on the computer. You need a real model. So you would have to, uh, Unicamp could help uh, do this. Perhaps when Rick is down on his Fulbright, you would have to build a collaborative model, one that is simple, that doesn't take too long, that does answer questions that people ask, um, so that you would have confidence that the model was correct. Um, you would have to have a uh, framework for involvement that was transparent. And we have many ideas about how to do this. Here's a, a simple idea uh, that was born in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, there were some very sophisticated critics. Uh, you can imagine in Boston, many universities. So the critics of the water department were Harvard PhDs. Uh, in order to, uh, I have found this true from my work with the Corps of Engineers, um, that when I was a young man, I would accompany a general in full military uniform, and he would go to a public meeting that he had arranged. People would leave their homes and come to his meeting. He would make a speech to the people, and guess what? They didn't believe him. Because they didn't know the general, uh, because the uniform uh, was off-putting and because there was no relationship there. So on the National Drought Study, we developed a different approach. We said, there are people in the public who are expert on these issues and many people in the public trust them. So your job is not to broadcast a message to the general public. Your job is to find those experts that people trust and win their trust, which means you have to answer their difficult questions, you have to be honest. When they ask for data, you have to give them data. So how did Boston do that with these very sophisticated critics? They said, we'll hire you. They brought the critics inside the water association, they gave them desks, they had access, they could go to all the meetings held by the president of the water authority, um, they could uh, have access to any of the databases and models that the water system used. And when uh, the water system made decisions, they sat in the room and debated those decisions. A very simple thing, hire stakeholders and have them inside the company. Um, you'd have to develop these drought response options collaboratively, and to do that, there would have to be a public discussion about what the impacts are. As an outsider, I read the blogs, I, I hear about people who don't get water delivered to the top floor, uh, fire hydrants without water, uh, water cutoffs, um, because there's no way to reduce pressure, that water is just cut off. But it's a very random picture, and I really have not been able to find any good assessment of how the reduction in water service affects people. So this would be one of the first things you would have to do because what you would like to do, what we do in California, is first reduce the water use that affects the least. So I don't water my lawn. I don't wash my car. This is no big deal. Get rid of those things first, but don't kill people. Don't uh, stop watering a crop but don't uh, kill trees that will take 10 years to reestablish. So you need an impact assessment. And then you need a series of practice decisions that could begin within a few months. So uh, my question, our question for this group, um, are we crazy? Is this a possibility? And if there is any possibility, what would you do? What would be the next step? And now I, I throw it open to you and ask for your advice. Regado. <laughs>